And welcome to Wednesday in the Word. Here we are once again, um, gathered around the Word of God. I got to thinking about this last night. You know, we originally started doing these, I guess you could call them virtual Bible studies or virtual teachings or, you know, whatever you want to call them. Um, during the height of all of the COVID shutdowns of 2020. And I'd originally thought, well, you know, we'll temporarily do kind of a virtual Bible study, kind of a way to reach out to people. And then it kind of took on a life of its own and kind of caught on and some other people other than just our immediate church family began to participate. And so here we are, you know, some three years later or better, still doing it. And it's it's been a blessing, I think, to people. And it's just a good way if uh, people can't all get together in a particular geographical location, it allows us to, you know, gather and uh, be together around the Word and fellowship in this way. So, thank you. I said all that to say this. Thank you to all those who have been participating, who will, who will come on tonight and those who will pick it up later. We really appreciate it. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our time of study tonight and talk about where we're going. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you right now. We thank you for your holy written word. We thank you that the entrance of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple, and we're simple people. We need you to teach us. We're dependent on you, Lord. And we just ask that you would open our eyes to behold wondrous things from thy law. Holy Spirit, live big in us tonight. The teacher that abides within, take charge and cause understanding to come to your people. We yield to the anointing of the precious Holy Spirit right now. And we believe you to guide us in the word tonight, in your word that's already anointed. We pray that that anointing would be released on those who hear it tonight. And we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. And welcome right up front there to Vince. Good to have you there with us, brother, as always. And we know there will be others who will come on with us as well. Well, we are on our current series, as you know, that we've entitled Angels and the Unseen Realm. This is part six of that series. And there's much we don't know about this realm, the spirit realm, the unseen realm. There's a lot we don't know about it. But what we do know is revealed in the scriptures. Now, I know that you can learn some things about the spirit realm from some other writings and such, but we've been focusing on the Word of God, the scriptures, and what we, what we do know about the spirit realm is revealed in the Word. Angels exist. Now, we've established that. We know they do very clearly in the Bible. Angels exist. And their primary assignment is to minister to and for us as believers. The writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews 1.14, Are they not all, speaking of angels, ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who are heirs of salvation? That's us, folks. And that is their primary assignment. Now, we're looking at this subject in the form of questions often asked about angels. We're going to continue with that format tonight. And a good evening there to Glenda. Welcome to you as well. Blessings. Well, here's our first question we're taking up tonight. Here's where we're starting. Who is the angel Gabriel? Who is the angel Gabriel. Now, apart from Michael the archangel, now Michael, we said last time, is the only angel specifically called an archangel. Now, there may be others, but, and I personally believe there are, but Michael is the only one identified specifically as an archangel. Now, hello there to Diana as well, and probably John there with you as well. Blessings to you folks. But uh, the only other angel other than Michael the archangel that is named in Scripture is Gabriel. Now, that might, that might take a bit of qualification, if I might. Um, in Isaiah chapter 14, 
we do see another angel named. Now, he is named after he has fallen, but he's still named. And, of course, I refer to Lucifer, as it says in the King James Version. In Isaiah chapter 14, the Bible says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Son of the morning there, by the way, is probably more accurately translated as morning sun or son of the morning, or you could even say morning star. Interestingly enough, in the book of Job, the Bible says that at the creation, the, the, the morning stars sang and the, and the sons of God shouted for joy. Well, the morning stars are understood to be angels that sing and worship. Well, if Lucifer was a morning star, it is believed that he was the leader originally of heavenly worship. And by the way, I don't want to get stuck on Lucifer here, but Lucifer is not his proper name. Lucifer, in our King James Version, was actually borrowed from the Latin Vulgate, Jerome's Latin Vulgate. That's where the name Lucifer came from, but his actual name in Hebrew was Hallel. Interestingly enough, you have Gabriel, you have Mike El, and you had Hallel. And that was Lucifer's, when we know as Lucifer, that was his proper Hebrew name. Okay, that was a side journey there, thrown in free of charge. But we have Gabriel. Now, his name means God is my strength or the mighty one. Now, though he is not specifically called an archangel, he is, without a doubt, a high-ranking angel. In fact, we are told that he stands in the very presence of God. That's pretty high-ranking, if you ask me. Furthermore, messages in the Bible that were delivered by him are of the highest importance. They're the ones that were given to Gabriel, these very highly important messages. Now, let's look at the references to Gabriel. First of all, he gave understanding of the vision to Daniel. Now, Gabriel was told to explain to Daniel the meaning of a certain vision. Now, this is over in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 16. In that verse, we read the following. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. The man being Daniel. Make this man to understand the vision. Now, Gabriel then explained to Daniel about the rule of the kingdoms of Medo-Persia and Greece. Medo-Persia was the ruling power in the land at the time. And Gabriel brought a message that told Daniel about the rule of Medo-Persia, and then he told him about the rule of Greece, which was the next world power we know from history. He also told Daniel about the premature death of Alexander the Great, who was the first ruler of the kingdom of Greece. Very fascinating stuff. Secondly, Gabriel gave the prophecy of Christ's coming. Now, in another appearance, Gabriel gave Daniel the explanation of the, of the prophecy of Christ's coming. This is in the next chapter, which is Daniel chapter 9, down here at verse 21. The Bible says, Yea, whiles I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, began being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation, or you could say the evening offering, or the evening sacrifice, okay? Now, um, this was a time of despair for the nation when Gabriel came to Daniel with the message of hope. Aren't you glad that God can give you a message of hope when you're in despair. Amen. Amen. Well, he gave him a message of hope. Hold on here. I got to do a little technical work here. There we go. All right. Had to do, had to pick up uh, something on the floor. Anyway, that was all live. So praise the Lord. Anyway, um, but it was a time of despair for the nation when Gabriel came to met Daniel with this message of hope. Now, his name, Gabriel, is again, God is my strength, or mighty one, and that testified to the all-powerful God 
who was about to deliver his people from the bondage of captivity and bring them back into the land of promise. Now we find him saying over in chapter 9, verse uh, 22 and 23, let's look at that. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplication, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Now, he spoke with, with Daniel, instructing him. Now, Gabriel then proceeds to reveal the great prophecy, and if you are a student of Bible prophecy, and about everybody who joins this group on Wednesday night is a student of eschatology, which is the study of end things, the doctrine of end things, or end times. Well, in the study of eschatology, you no doubt have heard uh, referred to the prophecy of Daniel's 70th week. Okay, that's recorded here in Daniel chapter 7. So, what Gabriel reveals is the great prophecy of the 77s or the 70 sets of sevens, we could say, I think, to Daniel. And he said, coming on down here, verse 24, he said, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. All right, now he goes on here. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublesome times. Then he says, and after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood unto the end of the war. Desolations are determined. The prophecy ends in verse 27. And he says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation or the offering to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. What in the world does that mean? Well, we're going to try to break that down because this is the message that Gabriel brought. Okay, now, um, so here, here's, here's what we've got. This is one of the greatest prophecies in all the Bible. Indeed, it told us the exact time when the Messiah would come the first time, as well as the exact time that he will come again. Yeah, this, this, this precise time of his second coming will only be known, however, at the end when a certain event takes place, and that is the abomination of desolation. What is that? That is when this individual known as the man of sin, the son of perdition, most infamously known as the Antichrist, that's when he will come in. He will come in and bring in an image of himself and stop all worship to any God, any offering to any God, and he will demand himself to be worshipped, and he will come right into the rebuilt Jewish temple and he will do this at about the halfway point of the seven-year, what we know as Great Tribulation. Okay, now, this will be the, desolate, uh, the abomination of desolation. It will be the signal that the end has come, and in three and a half years from that point, Jesus, Messiah, will return to earth to reign. So when that event takes place, the people who are on the earth at that time will know in three and a half years, Jesus will be back to reign on the earth. Wow, and that prophecy revealed all that. 
Amen. Now, now, number three, talking about Gabriel, he was possibly the glorious angel. It's possible that Gabriel is the unnamed glorious angel who interpreted the vision of Daniel in the third year of Cyrus. Now, back at Daniel chapter 7 and verse 16, um, well, we, we, let, let's, let's back up here. We read the following concerning this angel. This is in chapter 10, actually. Verse 5, I, I got in my wrong place here. Uh, Daniel 10, 5, the Bible says, Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Euphaz. Now, he's not named, but it's very possible this too was Gabriel. Another unnamed angel interpreted the visual, vision Daniel received during the reign of Belshazzar. Uh, this angel may also have been um, Dan, uh, Gabriel. We go back to chapter 7 and verse 16, and the Bible says, I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. This one is not named. He could have been Gabriel, however. All right, now, we're going to come over here and talk about things in the New Testament. Because number four, Gabriel announced the birth of John the Baptist. As we move to the New Testament, we find the angel Gabriel announced the birth of John the Baptist to his father, Zechariah. This is over in Luke's Gospel. And you can certainly turn over there if you want to. But Luke's Gospel, chapter 1 Verses 11 and 12 is where we find this. And here's what the Bible says. And the, there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. All right. Now, let's read verse 19 there as well. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee, show thee these glad tidings. All right. Now, this important event, this, this monumentous event, the coming birth of the forerunner of Messiah, necessitated the sending of Gabriel. Now, here he's called an angel of the Lord, or possibly the angel of the Lord. According to Gabriel, he has an exalted position among the angels. The Bible says he stands at the right hand of God. You don't get much higher than that. huh? Amen. All right, and number five, we know he appeared to Mary. The angel Gabriel also appeared to Mary to announce the conception of Jesus. Now, we're still in this first chapter of uh, Luke, Luke's gospel, coming down here to verse 26, and the Bible says, and in the sixth month, sixth month of what? The sixth month of uh, Elizabeth's pregnancy with John the Baptist, okay? And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin, espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. All right. And this is what he says. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. Hallelujah. He was sent to announce the birth of Jesus, the Savior of the world. Pretty big, monumentous stuff that a Gabriel is sent to announce. I want you to notice the pattern we're seeing here. Now, we have some other appearances of the angel of the Lord. Now, while there are only four times in the Bible, when Gabriel's name is specifically mentioned, there are other occasions where he may have appeared as the angel of the Lord. Now, several times in the New, Test New Testament, a personage called the angel of the Lord appeared. Now, though he's not named, 
it's likely that he's Gabriel, since Gabriel is designated as the angel of the Lord back there in Luke 1.11. We find that Gabriel is an angel of the highest order. Amen. Now, we've covered Gabriel. Who is Gabriel? Any comments or questions before I move on to this next thing we're going to look at? Now, he is, uh, he announces that, uh, yeah, important announcement. Gabriel is a messenger uh, angel and he okay. is sent to announce, you know, world changing, if you want to say it that way, things. But he is a messenger angel. Now, pardon me, I had to get a drink there. Um, if indeed, okay, now let's just throw this in as a little bonus. Okay, if indeed, Mike, we know Michael is an archangel, he's identified as such. Now, if, if Gabriel, although he's not identified as such in the Bible, if he is an archangel, and if Lucifer was an archangel, or Hillel, you have Michael, who is clearly a warring angel, okay? So he would no doubt be in charge of a third of the angelic host who are warriors. Then you have Gabriel, who is a messenger angel. If he is an archangel, he could have been in charge of a third of the angelic host who are messengers, okay? Messenger angels. And then if you have Hillel, who was a son of the morning or a morning star, if he, was in, if he was in charge of heavenly worship, which many believe he was before the throne of God, then perhaps he was in charge of a third of the angelic host who were specifically worshipers. Well, we know from Revelation chapter 12 in that imagery, the great red dragon drags with his tail and takes with him a third of the stars of heaven. Well, in biblical imagery, Stars refer to an ah! refer to angels. I'm sorry. There was a little spider on the table. It wasn't a spider for, for the record. It was oh. it was a gnat, but that's all right. Whatever it was. <laughs> Woo! It hey, that's all that's all live. Man, I'm telling you. Wow. You, you never know what you're going to get. If anybody was getting a little sleepy well, there, you're probably awakened now. So praise the Lord. I'll have to get a piece of tape and put it across my mouth. Twice. No, it's it's all right. It's all right. Praise oh. the Lord. We, and we, you know, we just keep going. So hallelujah. Anyway, Sorry. that's all right. Uh, wow. I'm, praise I'm the Lord. I'm so interested in what yeah. we're talking about. Yeah. Anyway, so <laughs> okay. if, a third, if a third of the angelic host the Bible says that the great red dragon drug with his tail a third of the angelic host. There, uh, in biblical imagery, stars of heaven or stars are angels. So he took a third of the angelic host. Anyway, um, that's a side journey. But, but, you know, that's just something to think about. That's, you know, we don't have the Bible telling us this. This is just something to think about. Maybe that occurred. All right. If there's no other comments or questions... Uh, I'm going to go on to this next thing. Our next question is, who is the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament? Now, though all the good angels are angels of God or angels of the Lord, there is one special angel who is distinct and unique from all the other angels. He's called the angel of the Lord or an angel of the Lord. Now, First of all, he appears in both Testaments. The Bible in both Testaments speak of this personage called the angel of the Lord, the angel of the presence, or the angel or messenger of the covenant. Okay? He appears in many contexts in Scripture. Now, the manner in which he is described sets him apart from all the other angels. I want you to know that. His appearances bring up a number of important questions. Who is he? Is he more than just a mere angel? What conclusions can we make about his identity from the Bible? Well, there are three possible, three possible, there are three possibilities, if I can get that out, as to his identity. Okay. 
Three major views have been put forth as to the exact identity of the angel of the Lord. They are as follows. Option number one, he was a mighty angel who acted as the special representative of the Lord. Now, the late Charles Capps came down on that option. He said, and he identified, I heard him teach on this, he identified the angel of the Lord as the Lord's special personal, if you will, angel. Okay, So he was a mighty angel who acted as the special representative of the Lord. There, there are those who believe that. Option number two, he's God the Father assuming a human body. Now, there are those who say that. Number option three, he is the Son of God, taking, he's God the Son, rather, taking a body for a short period of time. Now, each of these views, again, has its supporters. Now, I got to tell you, I come down on the option that the angel of the Lord was indeed a pre, uh, pre-appearance of Messiah Jesus before he came on the earth as the Son of God. That's the option I personally believe. But again, there are these three options. Okay, now let's talk about the appearances of the angel of the Lord. See, to determine which view best fits the evidence, we'll consider some of the major appearances of the angel of the Lord and make some observations about those appearances. First, he appeared to Hagar. Now, the first recorded appearance of the angel of the Lord was indeed to Hagar, Abraham's mistress, if you will, and the mother of his son, Ishmael. Now, we read in Genesis. This is in Genesis 16.10 in the NIV. The Bible says, The angel added, I will also increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. This angel spoke, I want you to notice, in the first person to Hagar while he made his promise. Indeed, he said that he himself would multiply the descendants of Hagar. The angel, therefore, identified himself definitely with the Lord. If he wasn't the Lord, he identified himself with the Lord, okay? After the appearance of the angel of the Lord, Hagar spoke, She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That's in Genesis chapter 16, verse 13. So Hagar believed that she had spoken directly to God. Therefore, she seemingly thought the angel was indeed the Lord himself. Okay? All right. Secondly, the angel of the Lord appeared to Abraham and Sarah at Mamre. Three men, the Bible tells us in Genesis 18, appeared to, um, appeared to Abraham and his wife Sarah at the plains of Mamre. Now, they had come to inform Abraham and Sarah concerning two matters. First, the son that God had promised them would be born to Abraham and Sarah the next year. They came to bring that message, and sure enough, a year later, guess what? Isaac was born. Okay, so that came to pass. They came to bring that message. All right. Second, the evil cities of Sodom and Gomorrah would be destroyed. And one of the three visitors who gave them this information is specifically called the Lord. And this is in Genesis 18.1. The Bible says the Lord, L-O-R-D, uppercase, that would be Yahweh, that would be Yehovah, the Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. One of these three personage is indeed identified as the Lord himself. Okay. Thirdly, the angel appeared to Abraham on Mount Moriah. On another occasion, you'll recall, God told Abraham to bring his son Isaac to Mount Moriah to be offered as a sacrifice. Now, Abraham obeyed and was about to take Isaac's life when God intervened. The Bible says the angel of the Lord stopped Abraham, saying, 
do not, this is in Genesis 22, 12, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your only son from me. The angel told Abraham, check that out, that he had not withheld from, he had not withheld Isaac from himself. Okay, this seems to indicate that this was the Lord that was speaking. He, he then called a second time to Abraham. The angel of the Lord, uh, this is down in verse 15, starting at 15. Uh, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Now, in the next instance, the angel of the Lord who called out to Abraham seems to be Yahweh, the Lord himself, since he used the first person, I, in describing himself, interestingly enough. Now, we know, fourthly, that he appeared several times to Jacob. Uh, in fact, uh, we read in Genesis uh, verse 31, uh, chapter 31, verse 11, Then the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, and I said, Here I am. In this instance, he's called the angel of God. Now, Jacob wrestled all night with this personage, this angel, if you will, who finally disabled him. He had, he had caused the, 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 the joint on his, uh, his thigh, really, to come out of joint. And the Bible talks about that. The next morning, Jacob understood that it was God himself with whom he had wrestled. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Now, at the end of his life, Jacob spoke of God and the angel of the Lord as identical. Uh, in fact, this is Genesis 48, 16. The angel who has delivered me from all harm, May he bless these boys. May they be called by my name and the names of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and may they increase greatly upon the earth. Again, we find this particular angel identified with the Lord. Now, how about, fifthly, Moses and the burning bush? The angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in the burning bush. We read the following in the book of Exodus. This is Exodus chapter 3, and I'm actually going to turn back there. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 2. This book is known as Shemot in the Hebrew Bible, but we know it as Exodus. All right, Exodus chapter 3 and verse 2. Let's see what the Bible says. It says, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, him being Moses, in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. The angel explained who he was. Okay, this is in uh, verse, uh, what is this, verse 6. He says, moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Um, the martyr Stephen, in his famous sermon in Acts chapter 7, emphasized this special event. He said over there in Acts chapter 7, he said, um, Let's see, where is it? Oh yeah, 40 years later, an angel appeared to Moses from a burning bush in the desert near Mount Sinai. Moses was surprised by what he saw. He went closer to get a better look, and the Lord said, I am the God who was worshipped by your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses started shaking all over and didn't dare look at the bush, the Bible says. This was, I don't mind telling you, 
a monumental event in the history of God's dealing with humanity. Scripture seems to indicate that it was the Lord Himself who appeared as an angel. Okay, and then, sixthly, there was God's promise to send His angel. God's, uh, during the time of Moses, God promised to send His angel ahead of the children of Israel. In the book of Exodus, we read the following promise of God. This is over in Exodus 23, and I'm going to come over there myself. I just like turning to these passages. Now, we have put these references right in the notes, but I like, um, you know, looking at these references. But this is down at verse 20 of uh, Exodus chapter 23. The Bible says, Behold, I send an angel. If you notice in your Bible, if you turn to this passage, Exodus 23, 20, angel there is uppercase A. He says, Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. All right, now, let's read down here. Beware of him, or pay attention to him, uh, and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies and an adversary unto thy adversaries. Verse 23, For mine angel shall go before thee and bring thee in unto the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. Amen. All right. Now, the Israelites were told that they must obey this angel. Why? Because the name of the Lord, yud heh vav -Heh, Yahweh, Yehovah, was in him. Now, since God would never share his name with any created being, it seems that this angel must be God himself. Isaiah the prophet wrote, I am Yahweh, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. That's Isaiah 42, verse 8. Uh, the New Living Translation says, I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to anyone else. I will not share my praise with carved images. Now, God specifically says that he will not share his name or his glory with anyone else. This is why many people think that this particular angel, this messenger, must be God himself. Amen. All right. How about Joshua? An imposing figure appeared to Joshua. Scripture records the following. This is over in uh, Joshua chapter 5, beginning at verse 13. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword and a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then the Bible says, Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And the Bible says Joshua did so. Now, Having Joshua immediately remove his sandals reminds one of the Lord telling Moses to remove his sandals in God's presence at the burning bush. This seems to be, just throwing this out there, this seems to be another indication that it was the Lord himself who made an appearance to Joshua. Wow. Well, eight. The people of Israel... In the wilderness. The angel of the Lord also appeared to the people of Israel in the wilderness. We read the following account. This is over in um, uh, Judges 2, 1 through 5, I believe. Anyway, it says, Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochum, and he said, 
I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their God shall be a snare to you. Now, as soon as the Lord, uh, as the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the people, still reading the scripture, the people lifted up their voices and wept, and they called the name of that place Bochum, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. And that's Judges 2, 1 through 5. Notice this angel said that I have brought you up from Egypt. He spoke of the land that I swore to give to your fathers. He also spoke about my covenant with you. These are references which it can only refer to God and to Him alone. This is another example as to why many people believe the angel of the Lord was the Lord Himself. Amen. Now, how about Gideon? Number nine. Gideon was a man who was called by God to raise an army to defeat the innumerable Midianites. Because Gideon was a timid person, the Bible reveals him as such, God paid him a visit to assure him that all would go well. After the encounter, Gideon exclaimed, this is in Judges 6, 22 and 23, Then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace be to you, do not fear, you shall not die. If it was an only an angel and not God that Gideon saw, then why was he afraid for his life? Well, how about Samson's parents, number 10? The angel of the Lord appeared to a Hebrew woman and her husband to announce the birth of a son named Samson. He was to deliver the people of Israel from their enemies. Now, Judges 13, 21 and 22, the Bible says, When the angel of the Lord did not show himself again to Manoah and his wife, Manoah realized that it was the angel of the Lord. We are doomed to die, he said to his wife. We have seen God. They identified the angel of the Lord with God himself, interestingly enough. Now, although these 10 instances, uh, these 10 appearances identify the angel of the Lord with the Lord himself, there are other appearances um, of, of the angel of the Lord where he's distinguished from God. We read the following in 2 Samuel. This is 2 Samuel 24, uh, verses 4, 15 and 16. So the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel from the morning until the appointed time. And there died of the people from Dan to Beersheba 70,000 men. And when the angel stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who was working destruction among the people, It is enough. Now stay your hand, and the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. Now, in this instance, okay, the Lord stopped the destruction that the angel of the Lord was causing in Israel. So there's a distinction there. Zechariah wrote the following, And they reported to the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees, we have gone throughout the earth and found the whole world at rest and in peace. Then the angel of the Lord said, Lord Almighty, how long will you withhold mercy from Jerusalem and from the towns of Judah, which you have been angry with these 70 years? So the Lord spoke kind and comforting words to the angel who talked with me. In this particular episode, the angel of the Lord is in dialogue with the Lord himself. So the fact that the angel is asking questions so as to gather information reveals that he cannot be identified with God, the one who knows all things. In these two instances, the angel of the Lord is differentiated 
from the Lord himself. All right. Now, um, one of the amazing things we discover about the angel of the Lord is how often this personage appeared at a turning point in history. You have to understand that God does monumentous, monumentous things, monumental things, maybe that's the better way to say it, at significant points in history. Now, God lives outside of time, but in dealing with mankind and dealing with the earth, he deals in time. In fact, what God did when he created the earth and when he created mankind, he carved, if you want to use this terminology, he carved out a piece of eternity and cast it into the earth realm and called it time. And that's what we live in. Okay? Yes. So, amen. So, you know, that, that, that's an interesting thing. But God does things at monumentous, at turning points in history. Now, f uh, furthermore, on ten of these occasions when he appeared, talking about the angel of the Lord, this angel spoke in the same way that God himself spoke. But this has caused many to believe that the angel of the Lord was actually God himself taking upon a human form for a short period of time. That's known in theology as a theophany. God taking on for a period of time the appearance of human flesh. All right. Now, this, this, again, this temporary appearance of God is known as a theophany. Is this what we should conclude? Did God himself appear as the angel of the Lord at certain times during the Old Testament period? The case for the angel of the Lord being a theophany, a temporary appearance of God in a, in a body, is as follows. Number one, he identified the Lord with the Lord himself. In some case contexts, the angel of the Lord is identified with the Lord. Now, we saw that in Genesis 16, uh, verses 7 through 13. We saw that in Genesis 22. Indeed, he speaks in the first person as the Lord. Now, secondly, we find that he has the power to give life. The angel of the Lord is said to have power to give life because we read of this in the book of Genesis when this angel is addressing Hagar, the angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely, I will, I will, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for a multitude. Only God has this power. No angel or any other created being can do this. Okay. For, thirdly, he's all-knowing. The quality of, as we say in theology, here it is, omniscience. That means all-knowing, okay? The quality of omniscience or knowing everything is attributed to the angel of the Lord. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her, you are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That's in Genesis 16, 13. Again, we emphasize the knowledge of angels is limited, but the knowledge of God is not. How many of you know God knows everything? He's, he's omniscient. Yes. Or, yeah, he's omniscient. Yes. Right. I, boy, I, I almost forgot the theological word myself. I remember the little sister that uh, she's no doubt moved to heaven many years ago, but she used to be down in Anita when I was just starting out in ministry, and she got so excited one time. We were over visiting her house, and she says, you know, I just discovered that God is omnipotent. <laughs> God is omnipotent. Well, he's omnipotent. Amen. But that, you know, he's, uh, anyway, praise the Lord. Means he's all-powerful, so I guess you could say omnipotent. Anyway, all right, praise the Lord. But he's also judge of the, all the earth because the angel of the Lord is called the judge of all the earth in Genesis 18.25. This is a title that belongs to God alone. Angels do not judge the entire earth. God does. Okay. Not only that, he can forgive sin. 
The Bible says that only God can forgive sin, but we read, we read the Lord saying in Isaiah, He says, it is I, this is Isaiah 43, 25, it is I who sweep away your transgressions for my own sake and remember your sins no more. Yet, the angel of the Lord had authority to forgive sins. The Lord said the following to the people of Israel, Exodus 30, uh, 23, rather, 20 and 21, it says, See, I am sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way and bring you to the place I have prepared. Pay attention to him to, and listen to what he says. Do not rebel against him. He will not forgive your rebellion since my name is in him. The, this equates the angel with the Lord himself. Not only that, he receives worship. You know, worship belongs, go ahead. Um, am I right or wrong? He's um, El Elyon. The Most High God. Yes, in everything. He knows everything. It right. It goes right along with that. You can, you can um, kind of bunch everything that God is by calling him El Elyon. He is the Most High God. Yes. And uh, in my very best English, they ain't no higher than the Most High, right? El Elyon, Most High. Amen. All right, now watch this. He receives worship. That is the angel of the Lord. Um, worship belongs to God and Him alone, right? Well, yet we're told that Moses and Joshua worshiped the angel of the Lord. These facts have led many to believe that the angel of the Lord should be identified with the Lord Himself. In other words, okay, on certain occasions in the Old Testament period, God Himself took on a human form in temporary appearances to His people. To sum this up now, we find that this particular angel is unique and distinct from all other angels mentioned in the Bible. Indeed, on rare occasions, He introduced Himself as deity, and yet He is distinct from God the Father. While he spoke face to face with people as a man, the evidence seems clear that he was more than a simple messenger sent from God. Now, um, go ahead. Okay, who, uh, when, you know, the story we tell about, well, it's a true story about our little. Uh, Lucy, mm -hmm. when she was born, only weighing one pound and four ounces, and uh, so tiny in an incubator, and um, we walked into her little room, and yeah, and there, next to her little incubator, was this enormous angel. You may. And behind that angel, Excuse me. there was two other angels. Yes. And. By the door, there was another one. Right. Now, I know uh, that angels are around our children because the Bible says that. Mm -hmm. And what I want to know is, who were those angels, do you suppose, that was around little Lucy when she was born? Well, I think they could have been warring angels. I think because there was a lot of spiritual warfare that, surrounded um lucy she almost died, died yeah. almost died several times several. there was a lot of warfare there there that and that and that's you know why we believe that lucy has a special calling of the lord on her life um anyone that the devil tries to take out so early on has a special place i believe in the plan of god now all children are precious all children are a blessing but there is a call of God on certain ones, and the enemy, while he does not know all things, he knows enough to see a little bit, and you know he recognizes destiny, he recognizes callings that are upon people, and he will move to thwart what God wants to do early on before anything can come of it. Now, but well, we could get off on a side journey right there, and eventually will, but I'm going to uh, hold that off for now. But yeah, but let's talk about 
the case for the angel of the Lord being God the Son, because I come down on the side of this argument, if you want to call it an argument. It's, we're not arguing, but I mean, you know, my I come down on the option, maybe that's a better way to say it, that the angel of the Lord was indeed a pre, now this is the big theological word, the pre-incarnate appearance. In other words, before he took on flesh, pre-incarnate, okay, before he before the incarnation, before the taking on of flesh. Okay, now, the evidence from these appearances has convinced many, and I, I'm among these, that at certain times in the past, God took upon himself a human form to appear as the angel of the Lord. This being the case, we need to examine the evidence to see which member of the Trinity became the angel of the Lord. If the angel of the Lord was truly an appearance of God in human form, and I believe he was, it seems that it's God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, who made these appearances. Why? Because God the Son is the only one who has taken on human flesh. Amen. When he came and was born in Bethlehem's manger, he took on flesh. God the Father did not come and take human flesh. God the Holy Spirit did not take human flesh, but God the Son did. All right. Now, before he came to, to earth, and we're running out of time here, but before he came to earth to live as a human being, the pre-incarnate Christ appears to a number of people on a few select occasions. The reasoning is as follows. For one thing, the angel is called Yahweh the Lord. He's identified with God himself, therefore the angel is the Lord himself. Although the angel is called the Lord, he is sometimes treated as a distinct person from the Lord. This is consistent with, by the way, the doctrine of the Trinity, where the three members of the Trinity, though they are one, are distinct from one another. One God manifested in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All right. Now, the best candidate, I believe, for the angel of the Lord is God the Son, Jesus Christ. The identification with God the Son, Jesus Christ, is made as follows. Number one, and I'm going to run out of time, I think, so we may have to pick this up next time. But only God, the Son, has assumed a human body. Now, we said that a moment ago. In the New Testament, God the Father is unseen, as is God the Holy Spirit. While we hear the voice of God on a number of occasions, God the Father on a number of occasions, and the Holy Spirit comes down in bodily form like a dove, only God the Son took upon himself a human body. Therefore, it is consistent with what we know about God the Son that he would appear in a human body on a few select occasions during the Old Testament period before he became a human being in the person of Jesus Christ in the New Testament era. See, he's always been the Word. He's always been God. But he became the Son. Okay? Now, I think that we're going to run out of time right on that, and I don't have time to develop this any farther. So I'll tell you what, we'll pick up here, finish this part out next time, and then um, we, guys, there's several more things we're going to cover here, but uh, we'll finish up this, and then we'll move on to some other things next time. I think we better close it down because if I, if I don't, uh, we'll just run over time. So let me just go back here real quick and say hello to our folk. Uh, good evening there to um, Vince. Again, thank you, my brother, for being there. Glenda, thank you for being with us. Diane, John, thank you for being with us. Hello there to Nancy. Thank you for being with us. And hello there to Deb. And good evening to you as well, my sister. Okay. Now, if you have any comments or questions, go ahead, any further comments or questions or observations, whatever, uh, go ahead and chat those in at this time. 
real quick, Sunday morning at the church, Boone C-O-G-O-P. Now, as you know, well, you don't know because we couldn't bring the service to you live last time. We did not have our communion observance last Sunday. I said I was moving it to this Sunday uh, simply because I was bringing a message that was not consistent with a communion theme, and I always try to uh, give a communion theme on Communion Sunday. So we're going to have communion, Lord willing, this Sunday. So if you're not able to join us at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning at 2028 Crawford, corner of 21st and Crawford, at 10 o'clock, you're not able to join us in person, then make sure to join us by live stream because I am confident, praise the Lord, that we are going to be able to bring our live stream to you this Sunday. I think I figured out uh, what I had to do there to um, manipulate it a little bit, and we'll get it on this time, Lord willing, I believe he is. Anyway, um, Vince says there, I believe in angels. I do too, my brother, very much. And he says, thank you, thank you, my brother, for saying that and for being there. But anyway, if you can be there with us Sunday, come in person, we'd love to have you. If you can't, join us by way of live stream where you see this study on Wednesday night. You can pick up our live service on Sunday. Okay, any other comments or questions before we bring the session this week to a close? This time really goes by quickly. We really appreciate the folks that come and join us live, even though we're a half hour later than we used to be. Uh, we really appreciate you coming out and uh, joining us. So, And thank you to those who would pick it up later. Okay, any other comments or questions? Last call for that. Pray for Kev that somehow, I don't know when soon, he would like to retire and... Uh, so he can put more of his energy, more of his time and uh, everything into doing the will of God, the work of God. So Amen. we just need the Lord. Yep, and uh, the Lord knows how he would cause that to happen. So um, anyway, just pray for us. Uh, I really, my heart in these last of the last days, my heart is to be more involved in the work of the Lord, the work of the kingdom, uh, not having to have so much time. Don't get me wrong, I'm thankful for what the Lord has provided for a job and all of that, but I would much rather be in a position to where I could put more time and energy into the work of the Lord. So pray for us. You know, the Lord knows exactly how that would happen, so pray for us, and we, yeah. we appreciate that. Okay. We appreciate you all. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. I want to remind you, and Glenda says, I'll be praying for you both. Thank you, sister. Thank you Thank so much. You. Please do. We appreciate that. Yes. But remember these words from 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even, even our, our faith. faith. Lord bless you.